section of that in just a little bit. Uh, thank you all for being here today um, to encourage each other to celebrate life in Christ together and, uh, and study a little bit and to, uh, to devote our voices in praise to God to, together. This is uh, something that happened this weekend, a couple of slides uh, for you. In fact, that's why the back pews over here are taped off. Because one of the projects that we had yesterday was to see if the restaining of some of these uh, pews was going to be possible. It's going to work, but it was a little sticky this morning. So, uh, but, but this is part of the crew that came up yesterday. We worked in the, the food pantry and the auditorium here. Uh, worked on all those chairs in the fellowship hall. Uh, we had to wake this guy up from sleeping on the job. But he was working on some of the pews too. Uh, there, there's a standing going on. We built a little pit out front, a little, uh, it's called the Gaga pit. So anytime you have a two-year-old or less, put him in there and just turn him loose. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a game that a lot of kids are going to be able to play out front that we uh, did. Here was our uh, project leader yesterday, and uh, it's good to have Randy around. Thanks for the presentation this morning, Randy. Uh, we had quite a few out yesterday, had a little breakfast, had lunch together, did a lot to the classrooms, and, and there's that final pit project. We just want to thank you all so much, so many of you that came out here yesterday to work and had a lot of, a lot of neat things that we got done, got to spend a lot of time together too, so it was really good. Uh, as most of you know, today is Mother's Day, so on the black words up there, if you have a mother, everybody say with me, thanks. Thanks, Mom. Yeah, that's, that's what I want to say. Especially since my mother is in the audience, uh, I wanted to say thank you to Mom. I wanted to tell you a little bit about her all day long today. Um, this was one of the uh, slogans I came away from my house with. Um, my mother had a policy, mother and father both had a policy of just anybody and everybody was welcome at the Savage House. And mom would always stand at the front door when someone would come to see us and she would say, come on in this house, come on in this house. And dad would say, if you're not at home, you ought to be. 
Now, a lot of people took that as, I better go back home. <laughs> but the, the atmosphere was set by mom and set by dad to say, whenever you come into my house, you're welcome for sure, uh, but you're only welcome if you make yourself at home. We want you to be at home. And let me tell you, my mother and my father took this to the nth degree at times. Uh, quite often we would wake up and somebody would be there that we didn't know. And they would have spent the night with us. Uh, a lot of times they were family. A, ton, a lot of times they were friends. A lot of times they were strangers. And they would say, Mom would say, come on in this house. And Dad would say, if you're not at home, you ought to be. And they would, they would just stay, some of them a day, some of them a week, some of them longer than that. And so we began to have this extended family of people that would, uh, that would stay at our house. But it was very important to my mother that they all felt welcome, that they all felt like family. And so when we sat around the table, she would always set that extra plate. And, and when we had roast on Sundays, remember the day when everybody had roast on Sundays? When we had roast on Sundays, whoever was visiting with us, they got as much roast as I got. And, and I, for a while, I think I had a hard time with that, but they had as many green beans as me also, so that was okay. It kind of balanced out. <laughs> when they went to the kitchen, they had equal access to the refrigerator, as I did. If there was something in there that I wanted, I could go get it. If there was something in there that this stranger off the street wanted, they could go in there and get it. I remember for quite a while we had, uh, we had pizzas. We had, well, my father had found a pizza truck that had turned over. And so he bought all those Tony's pizzas. He bought like 400 of them for a quarter a piece. And anytime any family would come over, we'd say, let's have pizza. Anytime any guests would come over, let's have pizza, and you get your own. Everybody gets their own pizza. Equally, everybody got their own, whether you were a member of the family or whether you were just visiting. Often, when we would have company over, uh, they would get the bed. And my brother and I and our sisters would often end up sleeping wherever we could, on the couch, on the floor, in the recliner, in the kitchen, by the pizza, if that's what it took. But the guests were gonna get the beds. You get where I'm going with all this? There was this attitude of, when you're in my house, whoever you are, you're my family. Did any of you experience that at your homes? Do you have that same attitude of when we have guests over, we want them to be like family? I want to read a passage to you today that, that I think is God's view of, of how we are to treat each other in the Lord. Jesus said this, In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Christ doesn't have just a little bitty uh, mini house or micro house. He's got a big house, and everybody is welcome. And he says, come unto me, all you who are weary in heaven. Come into my house. Come on in. That's Christ's most majestic uh, uh, conversation is to say, please, everything I'm doing is so you'll come into my house. Please come and be a part of my family. Have equal access to the refrigerator or to the beds or to the green beans or the dinner or whatever. Just come in to the house of God. And that's the way my family runs and that's the way this family runs. We want you to come into our house because it's not our house, it's God's house. Romans chapter eight, verse one says, therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Can I get it? Oh yeah. If we need to underline a passage in scripture, this may be the one that all of us need to underline. In Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. Because this is Mother's Day, I, I wrote a few things that, that mothers need to uh, realize that there is no condemnation about, okay? You are not condemned because of your occasionally messy home. Uh, you women can amen anytime you want to, okay? 
You are not condemned because of your occasional frustration with your children. You are not condemned because of your more than occasional frustration with your husband. You are not condemned because you have no children or because you have five children. You are not condemned because you, your lack of cooking skills or lack of interest in cooking. You are not condemned because you are divorced or raising kids alone. You are not condemned because you occasionally wish you were alone without husband and children. You are not condemned if your child explodes into hair-raising screams in public. You are not condemned because you cannot throw the birthday party to end all birthday parties for your child. You are not condemned because you cannot take your kids on a fantastic vacation. You are not condemned because you want a vacation from your children. And you are not condemned for not living up to the standards of your mother-in-law. Can I get an amen? And now everybody repeat with me the scripture on the board, please. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Nope. Romans 1, 2, 7. We're not going to read it. I want to sum it up for you in this slide. Here's what all of Romans has led to this crucial chapter 8. Before this, Scripture said, we have a holy God dealing with sinful mankind. Before the coming wrath, God sent a perfect Savior. Jesus Christ was crucified and risen. Justification and sanctification, and sanctification is available only through him by obedient faith. That's where we are, Romans 1, 1 through 7. Romans 1, 5 is the first book in that says, I want to tell you about what obedient faith looks like. At the very end of Romans, right before the very last verse, it says, I want to tell you, I said all this so that you will have obedient faith. And it's bringing you right to the center of people who have obedient faith. And it's going to describe who lives there, who is in that house. Who is it that has obedient faith? And what are the blessings of having obedient faith? And, and ground zero is at Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The now word means that those things that happened before. Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross. His death, burial, resurrection, the sanctification, the justification all happened because of Jesus Christ. And because of him, now it's time that all of us can have no condemnation. It's been, the whole world has been waiting for this to happen. Even nature itself was waiting for this thing to happen so everything can be reconciled, brought together in Jesus Christ and have no condemnation. And then the word now also means from now on, everybody who is in Christ will be able to live in a state of no condemnation. Nobody can hold anything against you because you're in Christ. You're in the house of God, and everything that is God's belongs to you. There is no condemnation for those who are children of God. That's where Paul is resting in Romans chapter 8, for those who are in Christ Jesus, in that house. That's the house I want to be in. Here's the list, and I'm just going to stand aside. I went through Romans chapter 8, and I highlighted all of these things. Now, as people who are living as lights to the world, that's us, we're part of the Light Project. If you ever want to tell anybody the blessings of being in Christ, and why you're doing this, why you're focused on Jesus Christ and being a faithful servant of Christ, an obedient person, is because of this list, Romans chapter 8. It says these things. I want, I'm going to put these up here, and then I'm going to read the, the passage. But it says there's no condemnation. We're set free in Christ. We're set free from sin and death. Righteousness lives in you. You receive life and peace. God's spirit dwells in you. You belong to God. You are sons and daughters of God. You have been adopted by God. God's spirit is in us, and it proves that we are children of God. We are heirs of all that God has. Verse 18 and following. The Holy Spirit of God intercedes for us. We have hope. All things work together for good. God has justified us. He's glorified us. We are more than conquerors. 
No one can separate us from the love of God. All this because of the love of God towards those who are, say that white word with me, in Christ. That's the deal. In fact, uh, Matthew chapter 28 says, when we are baptized into Christ, we have a companionship like never before. And Galatians 2, 3, 7, we'll read that in a little bit. It's, it's about being in Christ, and this is how you get in Christ. We're going to read this passage. It's a beautiful writing together. Uh, I know we don't read scripture enough, probably through the week. So I just intend to read quite a bit of this. Let's at least down through 17. So follow along with me, if you will. Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ doesn't belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ with Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, that's everybody in the house of God. We are debtors, not, not to the flesh, but live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the spirit you put to death, the deeds of, if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, the fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we also may be Glorified with him. <clears throat> Skip over 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, or rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Somebody's got to say, oh yeah. Somebody's got to think, man, it doesn't get any better than this. Man, we cannot overlook the blessings that come in Jesus Christ. I'm going to look up here. Christ says, come on in to my house. Christ says, our house is a beautiful place. You're more than welcome. You are able to just live as children of God. Just come on into my house. And God would probably say, my, like my dad, 
If you're not at home, you ought to be. Just make yourself at home in God's house. I'm not talking about in a house with walls. I'm talking about in the family of God. Just make yourself at home. Realize you belong here. You belong and you have all the blessings of anybody else who's been in Christianity a long time or just a couple of days. You have the same blessing that comes in Jesus Christ. <coughs> As many of you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. This is where the scriptures get down to the nitty gritty. And the next verse says you are all one in Christ Jesus. I hope that you feel at home with God and Christ sitting around your dining table today. We had a tradition in our family of every time a meal was served, we all sat around the, around the, the table. And, and mom always, you know, she always had things ready, or most of the time had things ready. Maybe a sandwich, it maybe soup, and maybe roast on Sundays. But we always started with holding hands around the table. And on occasion, Dad would pause and he'd say, tell me what you're thankful for before we pray. And so we, one at a time, would begin to, to list off some things. And inevitably, some of those things that were in the list that we just read would come up. I'm thankful for Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for salvation. I'm thankful for, for all the blessings that come in Jesus Christ. Those things. And I know my dad started smiling, you know, when those things happened. Now, around the table, it didn't always go smoothly. Because we were all savages. We all had different opinions at times. Uh, but my father, he knew, you know, that we needed to go on and pray together. And so one time around the table, we were sitting there. And, and instead of saying anything, he just kind of nodded his head. He would nod his head towards one of us, my brother or me, to say the prayer for that meal. And so as he were, we were old man, he kind of nodded towards Jay. He said, Jay? And Jay kind of paused for a second. He looked at me and said, Jerry? And I looked at Dad and said, back to you, Dad. We were all capable of praying. And we were all capable of thanking God for his blessings. But we had something around the table that was special. We could talk about God around the table, at our table, because he was there. We could talk about the blessings that he had given us because we had experienced so many of them. We could talk about times that he had saved us from tragedy. And we had a bunch of those. In fact, one of us has thought about writing a book saying, Times I Should Have Died in the Savage Family. Maybe you've got a similar book. We could talk about the challenges of life, but we knew that Jesus was with us through them all. We talked about God because he was part of the family and we were a part of his family. And our mother in her quiet, gentle spirit made sure that we knew that we were loved. Sometimes dad came down as, as a harsh dad, and not really harsh, but as a, as a father who needed to discipline his children. I know you cannot believe that that was ever the case. But my mother would always make sure that we knew we were loved. And at the end of this beautiful passage in Romans chapter 8, it says neither height nor depth or anything can separate you from the love found in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ, you cannot escape his love. If you're in Christ, you cannot escape his grace. If you are in Christ, you cannot uh, you can't es escape any of the blessings that God wants to pour on you. That's why we encourage everyone here to be baptized into Christ. Become a part of the family. Because in that family, we experience this, what this psalm, this psalmist wrote. He wrote, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's not that he was going to stay in church all his life. It's that he knew that God's house was a special house. And once you're in God's house, you are to be at home with him your whole life. And the reason he wants you to feel at home with him your whole life is because you're going to feel at home with him your eternal life. 
He's just getting you ready for something, Lord. He's just getting you some practice here for what's coming next. A home that's ready for you whenever you're ready for it. Let's pray together, church. Father, thank you for the men and the women in this household, in this spiritual household, that include you and that understand that you love us and they share that with their whole household. We're loved by you, Father. Thank you for loving us so richly and so completely. And Father, for those who are not in Christ, knock on their door. And I pray, Father, they'll let you in. And then I pray that you let them in as you want all of us to be in Christ, in the family of God, in the household of God. Thank you, Father, for giving us this picture of those who are in the household of God, being blessed now and blessed eternally. Thank you for this family that meets here. Thank you for the love that we have for each other. And thank you for the future we have in Jesus Christ. It's through him we pray. Amen. God bless you for being here today. Let's stand and sing song of encouragement. Christ stood in the night.